I'm Dr. Anjil Kakkar and I will be talking about endotracheal tubes. This is a very, very important uh, topic for your Viva Vosi and almost everybody is asked about endotracheal tubes, whether a normal PVC tube or a specialized endotracheal tube. So by definition, what is endotracheal tube? It is a device that is inserted through the larynx into the trachea to deliver medical gases and it's a connection between the breathing circuit and the lungs. Till date, it is the only gold standard equipment for securing airway. So it is classified into two types, standard endotracheal tube and specialized endotracheal tube. I will be talking in great detail about the standard endotracheal tube. If you are asked about the any tube, you should know about the standard endotracheal tube. It is a prototype over which every other tube is uh, based on. If you know the parts of endo standard endotracheal tubes, you can in, uh, automatically apply them in the specialized tube and uh, answer the uh, viva voci. So don't get hassled up. You should clearly know the and uh, standardized endotracheal tube and then you will automatically learn about the specialized tubes. So standard endotracheal tube, this is the most common uh, one which we use. It is, poly, it is made up of polyvinyl chloride, PVC ET endotracheal tube. If we start about the parts of the uh, PVC tube, you have to remember always and always hold it in an anatomical position. So this is the anatomical position. Never hold it like this. Don't hold it from the cuff. Don't hold it vertically. Always hold it in a vertical position, in an uh, anatomical position, the way you insert it into the patient's mouth or trachea. Okay. And there's a small mnemonic. See, we all know A, B, C, D, E. So we start with A, B, C, D. You have to start from either of them, either from this end or this end. So start from the away end. Okay. So the away end is the patient end. Okay. A for away, away patient end. B for bevel. Okay. Bevel and Murphy's eye. This is bevel and this is the Murphy's eye. Okay. C for cuff, curvature and the cuff inflating system. Okay. So A for away end, that is patient end. B for bevel with the Murphy's eye. C for the cuff, curvature and the cuff inflating system. D for the detailed marking. One by one, keep reading the detailed markings over the endotracheal tube. Okay. And E is the other end, that is the machine end. Okay, so all always remember A, B, C, D, E. So starting with the, this, this diagram also shows the various parts of the endotracheal tube from right from the bevel, the Murphy's eye cuff, the radiopaque line, the detailed marking, the inflating line and the machine end. So we will be talking about all of them one by one. Starting with the away end, that is the patient end, bevel, Nowadays, we have oral nasal tubes. Long back, we used to have oral tubes separate and the nasal tube separate. So the curvatures were, so the bevel angles were different. But now, we, as a standard rule, we have oral nasal tubes with a bevel of 38 degrees plus minus 10 degrees. This is the question asked. Okay. So, um, what is the advantage of having a bevel? The only advantage is it provides a better visualization. The mouth is a small opening. So, when you are inserting inside the bevel, has an angle, you, it provides a better visualization. In this picture, you can see this bevel. Along with this, this is a, a specialized tube, which is known as a Parker Flex tip uh, tube. This has a beak shaped tip. We, we will be talking about it in a greater detail later on. From then uh, uh, comes the Murphy's eye. Murphy's eye is the hole which is present on the opposite side of the bevel. Okay, this is the bevel. And this is the Murphy's eye, which is present. So there are two types of tubes again. One is the uh, with the Murphy's eye and the other one is which does not have a Murphy's eye. It is known as Magill's type. Okay. So the uh, what is the advantage of Murphy's eye? Advantage is when your bevel gets stuck against the tracheal end or with the gets obstructed uh, with the secretion, the Murphy's eye provides an alternative path for ventilation. What is the disadvantage? Your suction catheter, your fibro optic or your forceps through the fibro optic can get stuck into the Murphy's eye and the removal may be very difficult. Okay. Then coming to the C part, curvature of the endotracheal tube. As a standard rule, all endotracheal tubes have a standard curvature of 140 millimeters plus minus 20 millimeters. That is 14 centimeters plus minus 2 centimeters. Then next C is the cuff, tube cuff. 
So the cuffs are of two types. The high, vol uh, high pressure, low volume cuff, which were used in red rubbers. Low pressure, high volume cuff, which are used in polyvinyl chloride and utricle tubes now. The important question asked when you talk about tube cuffs is that what, uh, what was the need of changing from high pressure, low volume to low pressure, high volume? So as we all can see here, the red rubber tubes had high pressure, low volume and the tube cuff was elliptical. So the area in contact with the tracheal mucosa was less. So the pressure exerted, you know, when the area in contact is less, the pressure is exerted more. So the cuff pressure was transmitted over to the tracheal mucosa. And here you can see the tracheal mucosa and this is the capillary. The pressure was so much so that the capillaries used to get obliterated and the focal ischemia over that part used to occur. So the high pressure of the cuff used to get transmitted, obliterating the tracheal capillaries and hence causing the ischemia, ischemic injury. Now with the PVC cuff, which is a low pressure, high volume, you can see, see this, this is a uh, oval kind of uh, cuff. The area in contact with the tracheal mucosa is large. When the area is large, the pressure is equally distributed and is less over the tracheal mucosa and hence less chances of having ischemic injuries. So again, the tubes can be divided into two types based on the cuff. Uncuffed one and the cuffed one. Uncuffed one are the pediatric, uh, mostly used in pediatric, though now we have cuffed pediatric tubes also. The advantage of uncuffed tubes are less of uh, trauma because uh, the smooth curvature of PVC prevails and there is no um, rough surface of endo this cuff over the smooth surface. So there is less trauma, especially in the nasal intubation. And there is, these tubes are never oversized. Okay, they don't, they cannot, they don't cause uh, tracheal mucosal injury. Why? Because this, uh, the plain tube without cuff is always smooth. Whereas the cuffed one has a rough surface over the cuff. So when you are inserting, it may cause the uh, damage to the tracheal injury. That is why uncuffed has this advantage. What is the disadvantage? We all know there is a high chance of aspiration. The, the medical uh, gases leak is always there. There are high chances of dislodgement when if you have packed, uh, you are removing the pack or there is a sudden movement extension, uh, hyperextension of the um, patient's neck, then the chances of dislodgement of uncuffed tubes are high. And with the leak of medical gases, there are high chances of OT pollution as well. Coming on to the uh, cuffed tubes, there are multiple advantages, less chances of aspiration, minimal or no leak of medical gases, minimal or less OT pollution, better monitoring of endotracheal tubes and less chances of dislodgement or accidental extubation also. So disadvantage, as I told you, the cuff surface is a rough surface. So the chances of injury are more, especially during nasal intubation than tracheal mucosal injury. Uh, if the cuff is overinflated, then vocal cord injury. If your cuff is at the vocal cords, you have not inserted it well inside, then the inflation of cuff can cause vocal cord injury. And cuffed pediatric tubes, they have a smaller lumen. Okay, we all know that the pediatric uh, narrowest part is subglottic. So the uh, to bypass the subglottic, the size of the tube is less if we take a cuffed endotracheal tube, uh, pediatric tube and hence the resistance with the smaller size the resistance increases so we have talked so much about when you tell the examiner about the uh, tracheal mucosal injury vocal cord injury with the cuff inflation so examiner is bound to ask you <clears throat> about the cuff inflation system also so how do you inflate the cuff okay so this is the small you can see um, inflation line this is outside the endotracheal tube. The diameter of this is less than 2.5 millimeters of uh, millimeters. This is uh, this, this does not um, uh, obstruct the internal diameter of the endotracheal tube. And this is attached with the endotrache. This is attached with the pilot balloon. So in the in the uh, diagram also you can see this is the pilot balloon. This is the cuff inflation line. The pilot balloon has a spring loaded inflation valve it is a one way uh, sorry it's a one way spring valve 
it has a lure lock mechanism at the end when you take a um, when you take an empty syringe you attach uh, press the spring and then rotate the then the lure lock happens you cannot just attach and inflate it will never happen like that you have to attach press and rotate the syringe and then you will be able to inflate the cuff of the tube the more important thing is the internal diameter because this cuff stays outside the patient okay when the patient is intubated this cuff is outside so how do you you can always see the cuff and tell what size of endotracheal tube patient is being intubated with okay so inflation tube pilot balloon we know that it has a spring loaded one way valve and inflation valve is there one way lure lock connector at the end of the inflation uh, um, valve is there and after inflation when you detach the uh, syringe the uh, valve is sealed so in this you can see this is the this is the uh, one way valve uh, you have to attach rotate and then inflate so as we had already spoken about that how uh, uh, the the to tracheal mucosal injury can happen if with the over inflation of the cuff so there are mechanism there are equipment with which you can actually measure the cuff pressure so what is the most very commonly asked question what is the cuff pressure which you would like to keep that is 20 to 25 centimeters of water and how do you measure the cuff pressure these are the cuff pressure manometers provided by various companies this one which you can see here has a three way valve it's like a three way so the cuff inflating uh, the pilot balloon valve is attached to one end and the syringe is attached to the other you in keep inflating and the pressure will go up and you can stop at the 25 20 to 25 centimeters of water and this one it has a uh, balloon which you can squeeze and actually inflate and there is a there is a, um, a rotatory knob also by which you can actually deflate also so why i am saying the deflate is the is it possible the examiner can ask you is it possible that you have actually inflated it to 20 centimeters of water and intraoperatively when you checked it had become 30 centimeters or so yes that can happen so the question is why do you want to monitor the cuff pressure because the cuff pressure may increase during the surgery intraoperative period why because most of us are still using nitrous oxide and nitrous oxide diffuses into the cuff and we know it has an expanding property so the cuff gets over inflated intraoperatively and the cuff pressure increases sometimes the uh, area which is operated is near the cuff area only the surgical field pressure the instrument or sometimes the surgeons unknowingly put their hand over the trachea and the cuff pressure may again increase sometimes there is extremes of head tilt high altitudes also cuff if the patient is airlifted the high altitude also cuff pressure may increase and if the patient is coming out of anesthesia and straining the muscles and coughing then also pressure may increase so these uh, uh, equipments to measure the cuff pressure come in handy to measure the intraoperative cuff pressure so uh, how how do you limit the increase in cuff pressure exactly intraoperatively measure it deflate or inflate you will come to know do it with the pressure manometers but these pressure manometers they cost their cost they're expensive but once purchased they last for a long time then you can fill this uh, uh, sometimes what the other people do that they fill with the cuff with the saline or sometimes with lignocaine also some people have this practice of filling the uh, uh, cuff with lignocaine or saline so that there is no diffusion then there are balloon systems also that is lance pressure regulatory valve there is cuff in cuff so internal one is uh, uh, filled with the uh, air and the outer one with what is cuff in cuff regulatory pressure is there then bivona foam cuff is there this like this this is a specialized tube we will talk about it in later in great details in this the cuff is actually foam so you have to put a suction uh, to the inflating system so that the uh, cuff is totally deflated before intubation and before extubation also so coming on to the material of endotracheal tube ideal material you may be asked what is the ideal material to have an endotracheal tube so the there are 10 properties you should be able to tell low cost 
no tissue toxicity or lack uh, of tissue toxicity, transparency, non-inflammability, easy if it has to be reused, easy sterilization or it should be disposable. A smooth surface should be there. Um, less chances. Uh, it should be uh, it should be rigid enough so that it maintains its shape. It should be thermoplastic to confirm the patient's anatomy. More important, it should not react with patient's secretions or with the anesthetic gases and it should be latex free. So the various uh, uh, materials which have been used uh, for uh, formulating endotracheal tubes are to start with red rubber tubes. These were the initials one which were used in older times. The, the red rubber which was used was mostly natural rubber or synthetic rubber. Natural rubber was stable polymer of isoprene and the synthetic rubber is uh, elastomeric material from unsaturated hydrocarbons, monomers which are combined with polymers. The advantage of red rubber tubes was they were non-traumatic, they were adequately rigid and they could be reused after sterilization. Disadvantage, they were not transparent, they had latex, <clears throat> the cleaning was an issue because the transparency was not there, you could not actually ensure that the lumen is not obstructed with the secretions. Then the cuff was hard, cuff uh, on repeated sterilization, the cuff was losing its shape, the herniation of cuff was there and they were less resistant to kinking. So then came the polyvinyl chloride, which are monomers of vinyl chloride. Advantage, they are disposable, one use and throw. They are transparent, so you can ensure the, uh, the lumen is not obstructed. They are non-reactive, they are latex-free and they are they confirms to the patient's body and there are less chances of kinkability uh, as compared to the red rubbers, though they have a chance of getting kinked. Disadvantages, they are relatively more rigid, they're less elastic than rubber, they are traumatic because of their cuff and they have chances of sore throat. As we all know that the intubation can lead to sore throat. The other materials which are used are silicon, polyethylene and nylon and teflon. It is good to know, must know is red rubber and uh, polyvinyl chloride uh, material. But if you can answer that, yes, we have silicon tubes also, polyethylene tubes also, nylon and teflon also. Nylon and teflon are mostly used in laser resistant tubes. Less, they are less popular because there is a high chance of tissue toxicity. Polyethylene, they are made from polymers of ethylene monomer. Advantage, they are they can be reused after ETO. They are chemically inert. They do not cause any uh, chemical reaction with the body of the uh, with the secretions or the anesthetic gases. Disadvantage, they are very flexible and pliable, so there are high chances of getting kinked. Silicon. In this, the PVC is uh, a small amount of silicon oil is added in PVC, so they are latex free but they have a strength, they have increased strength. They can be reused again and again by autoclaving the tubes. Disadvantage, again, they are non-transparent, so the lumen uh, uh, continuity and uh, obstruction, uh, they are not obstructed, lumen is not obstructed, cannot be insured every time. Plus, they are expensive, so they cannot be used as disposables. So, after the material, we come to the, we have done the patient end, bevel, Murphy's eye, cuff, curvature, material of the tube. Now coming to the detailed marking, D part, detail marking. The first mark you see is the black mark. Some tubes have one single black mark. Some tubes have two black marks. So what is the importance of this black mark? This importance is that this, endo, this black mark should be just inside the glottic opening when you are intubating the patient. It actually marks that the, uh, the tube is adequately inside, it is not endobronchial and it is not too above, it is not touching the, it is not too deep and not too above, it is appropriately placed. In uncuffed pediatric tubes, this black mark is like this and it marks that the glottic opening, this black mark should be just inside the glottic opening. Coming on to the other marks, the next important is that the internal diameter will be written on to the <clears throat> endotracheal tube. So most of the endotracheal tubes will have internal diameter as well as the external diameter. So internal diameter is written in a bold form like this 6.5 and uh, millimeters and internal diameter is 
8.9. So what is the uh, relation between internal and uh, outer diameter is that outer diameter is mostly 2 to 4 millimeters bigger than the internal diameter. The other markings are it will be written single use or reusable. Mostly it is written single use. PVC tubes are disposable tubes. Then there is quality marking will be written. Uh, with uh, like the Z79 IT will be written. Many tubes these days do not uh, have this marking written on them. This marking or CE marking can also be present. So single use, then quality testing marking, then the um, mostly it is written as uh, oral or nasal or oronasal. Okay, then various length markings are there starting from, it may start from 16, or it may start from 18, okay, 18, 20, even markings are there. Sometimes there are odd markings also, 17, 19, 21, 23, 25, like this one it showed here in this uh, picture. So you may have single uh, even markings or the odd markings, which denote the length of the marking tubes. Then there is a blue line. See, you can see this blue line. Every In every picture, you can see this blue line. This is a radio opaque blue line which is there, it helps you. What is the uh, importance of this blue line? It helps you in identifying endotracheal tubes in an X-ray, okay? And the other thing which you may, which may be written on the endotracheal tube is the name of the manufacturer. So if I have this endotracheal tube, so this has black marks, if you can all see, okay? Then it has the name of the manufacturer, if it can be seen. Okay, then it has the internal diameter, then it has the oral nasal uh, thing which is written, and then it has the outer diameter also. Okay, so it is, and it is uh, two. Two is written and the cross is made. That means that it is single use. So mostly all these uh, endotracheal tubes will have these detailed markings on them. So we were talking about this Z Z79 IT. What is this tube marking? What what does this testing marking signify? So Z79 is actually an American na Nation Standard Institute, and IT is the tissue implanting testing. So what happens is when this tube is being made with this uh, uh, material is being uh, taken into this tube is cut into strips, small strips, and this strip is being inserted into the para vertebral muscles of the rabbit. Uh, along with the two controls which were which were already tested so the then the rabbit is sacrificed and the tissue is tested for any inflammation or any allergic reaction which is present or not so this is the american testing z79 it is the american testing and they are very stringent in their rules um, if the material passes then only the endotracheal tubes are made from those materials similarly i told you ce may be written so c is actually the european standard conformite european standard a european standard for testing medical equipment they are not as stringent as americans and uh, this testing is done by the medical and health regulatory authorities in europe so coming on to the other things about the tube this is uh, the tube size is the most important question most commonly asked question that how do you calculate the tube size for the patient so the pediatric patient you have to memorize less than three months three uh, no, three millimeters internal diameter three to nine is 3.5 more than nine months then age in years divided by 16 by four millimeters children less than six years of age age in years divided by three plus 3.5 millimeters and children who have age more than six then age in years plus divided by four plus 4.5 millimeters so this is the rough estimate and if you do not know the age of the patient we all know that we have to the outer diameter will correspond to the width of the lit, uh, distal phalanx of the little finger of patient's hand and in adult by rule all males usually uh, we intubate them with 8 or 8.5 and females 7 or 7.5 millimeters of mercury. So when we talk about the tube size, tube length is equally important. We do not want the endotracheal tube to go too much inside or too much outside. Black mark is one of the way 
to see whether the tube is inserted well enough. Otherwise, you can actually calculate the length of the tube also. In children, newborns, nine is the nine centimeter is the uh, mark where the tube should be fixed. At three months, it is 10, one year, it is 11 centimeters, and two years, it is 12 centimeters. In adults, males, usually we fix the endotracheal tube at 22 to 24, in females, 18 to 22. For nasal intubation, you have to add five centimeters if you are going uh, with this uh, uh, calculation. And there's also another uh, formula for the insertion of length as per the gender. For men, it is 11.413 plus 0 0.072 into height in centimeters minus 3 for males and for females it is 13.55 plus 0 0.056 into height in centimeters minus 3. So this also gives you exact uh, uh, length at which the tube should be fixed. But we all should remember to auscultate bilaterally to ensure the bilateral air entry is equal. So coming on to the machine end, the E part, the machine end, this, uh, there's a connector which is at the machine end of the patient. Usually nowadays we have plastic connectors. Earlier days we used to have metal connectors. The curved metal connectors were there, but now we have plastic connectors. This uh, is a universal male type of connector which actually gets fitted into the female connector of the breathing circuit of the machine. So this was all about the endotracheal tube. So if I tell you that you have been given a normal PVC endotracheal tube and you have one minute to describe it, then you will, how will you start? Start, hold it in an atmical position and start from A, the away end. So this is an endotracheal tube of uh, made up of polyvinyl chloride of size eight internal diameter. This is the patient end. The, there is bevel and a Murphy's eye at the patient end. Then followed by the cuff, which is a low pressure, high volume cuff, followed by two black marks for the adequate depth of the uh, uh, endotracheal tube so that the one black mark should be inside the vocal cord. Then there are various markings denoting the manufacturer, which is Romson's, the internal diameter 8 uh, millimeters. It is an oro nasal tube. It is uh, outer diameter is 10.5, 10.7. This is the inflation line of the uh, cuff, which has a pilot balloon. The pilot balloon has a spring loaded one way valve, which has a lure lock mechanism. These are the various uh, markings to actually denote the length of the tube, which is inside the patient where you fix it. There is a blue line here over the opposite side, which is a radio opaque line to uh, see the uh, see the endotracheal tube in x-rays. And this is the machine end. Okay, so this is how you explain in one go. So coming on to the specialized endotracheal tube, there are ample of specialized endotracheal tubes, reinforced, preformed, microlaryngeal tubes, fast track LMA endotracheal tube, laser surgery tubes, jet ventilation tube. So I'll be talking one by one quickly. Reinforced tubes, these are also known as fibro uh, flexometallic or wire reinforced or armored endotracheal tube. So what is present in this? There are concentric steel wires embedded in the wall of the endotracheal tube for entire length, barring the patient end towards the bevel. So the, the, um, this, as PVC had a detachable connector, the flexometallic the connector is non-detachable. The flexometallic also has a straight fall. It is not curved like this and hence needs a, a stillet for insertion always. The endotracheal tube of PVC, they get kinked like this if you put a knot, but the uh, wire reinforced or the flexometallic tubes, they do not get kinked. So they are used in head and neck surgeries, the tracheal and laryngeal surgery, submental intubation, retromural intubations, uh, uh, reinforced tubes are used. What is the disadvantage of these reinforced? Because they are very pliable uh, and they have a straight fall, I told you, they always and always require a stillet. Without stillet, you cannot intubate the patient. Then they cannot be used for nasal intubations. Then the uh, there is so much of recoil that sometimes accident accidental extubations can happen. 
if the tube size is long and you want to cut down the tubes to to uh, decrease the dead space you cannot cut down these to cut these tubes to decrease the dead space plus these tubes cannot be kept for long time for a longer intubation uh, and these patient and these tubes can also be deformed by the if the patient is getting awake the patient bites then these tubes can also be deformed like this then there are preformed tubes like this. These are, I am sure everybody must have seen, these are known as RAE tubes. When you pick up an RAE tube or you are given an RAE tube, you should always know the full form. That is ring, adair, elvin tube. So these are also two types of tubes. One is the, this is the south, uh, this is the south pole and this is the north pole. Okay, the south pole is the oral endotracheal tube and the north pole is the nasal endotracheal tube and uh, as we can see the uh, oral tube are smaller as compared to the nasal tubes so these were introduced in 19 and 1970 these are also available in various size and also as cuffed and uncuffed tubes so where do we use we use them in head and neck surgeries oral surgery especially cleft lip cleft palate the advantage is when you put a south pole tube you can fix it into the center and for the plastic surgeon it is very important that both the sides should look symmetrical so any lip reconstruction or cleft uh, cleft palate surgery uh, cleft lip surgery they want a better outcome that cosmetically it should look similar both the sides should look similar so they ask you to put it in center it marks a center to them and these tubes they have a special mark see this 20 centimeters mark is marked as a bold so it has a preformed curve. Preformed curve, here only the tube will be fixed. So tube, there is no chance of getting uh, thinking of the tube as the tube will be fixed here away from the surgical side. Okay. And similarly in the nasal also, they have a mark 28, 29. This is the mark which is there. The curve is there. The tube should be fixed at the curve. Only the circuit and the tube are away from the surgical side. And hence, the, uh, the surgical field is available completely to the patient. This advantage is that you cannot actually do the endotracheal suction through these curved tubes. Then tube, because of the curvatures, they have more resistance. And sometimes these tubes, they are taken up, they, the, these marks are based on the certain population. Sometimes the tube length may be too long or too short for a given patient so that the uh, tube may be inserted endobronchially if you uh, fix it onto the mark and may require a uh, fixation at a lesser length. So this uh, cannot be generalized to all the patient. So coming on to the next uh, tube, that is the microlaryngeal tube. This, the longer one is the microlaryngeal tube. The sizes which are available are four, five and six only. These are the thin um, internal diameter. They have a smaller in internal diameter, but their length is big. Their cuff also is of the size of endotracheal tube 8 of adult size. Why do we have this uh, the, these kind of tube? These kind of tubes are used in the laryngeal surgery where you actually require, you need to see. You need the intubation also, but you need to see the laryngeal in. Uh, inlet also so this is for the better visualization and workspace for the surgeon and uh, as i already told the length of the adult size uh, the tube is as of the eight size tube there the cuff is very thin high volume low pressure cuff is there it keeps the tube in the center and prevents from aspiration also and accidental extubation disadvantage as these are very narrowed uh, lumen tube there is high resistance there is incomplete exhalation and occlusions can happen very easily next tube are the laser surgery tubes so one thing i must tell you that laser surgery tube each tube is meant for specific type of laser surgery uh, the tube cannot be used for each and every laser surgery. Understood? The, each tube, there are multiple types of tubes. Each tube has a specific indication. So I will be talking in brief about them. The first one is laser shield 2 tube. This is made up of silicon tube. This is a silicon tube. It has an in, inner uh, aluminum wrap and an outer Teflon coating. It is used for carbon dioxide and potassium titanium 
phosphate lasers so ktp lasers not they cannot be used for ndag lasers and the cuff has methylene blue crystals and it should always be inflated why do we actually inflate with methylene blue because if the laser injury happens over the cuff and the cuff is burst then the blue uh, uh, blue blue color will indicate the cuff uh, has been ruptured and uh, cotinoids are placed with every tube they, so that we all know when you pick up a laser tube you should always be prepared to answer about the fire accidental fire laser fire okay i will not be talking about laser fire in my talk as i am already short of time the other one is laser flex tube this is the commonly used it is a double cuff tube with two cuffs two inflation lines uh, it, the, the cuffs are filled with the saline and they also have methylene blue this tube is also meant for carbon dioxide and ktp laser laser and not the ndag laser then comes the sheridan laser trickle tube this is the red rubber tube wrapped with the copper foil and this should be covered when intubated this should be covered with the water absorbent fabric i'm sorry and it has a very thick wall and this is also meant for carbon dioxide and ktp laser then there is norton tube this is uh, this is just for namesake that you may be asked which is the uncuffed laser tube it's a norton tube it is reusable it is flexible it's a spiral bound metal tube with stainless steel metal connector it has thick valves and it is used can be used for ktp carbon dioxide as well as ndag laser and what is the disadvantage it is an uncuffed tube so there are large leaks accidental um, extubations can happen dislodgement can happen so then again bivona foam cuff tube i had mentioned this earlier also this is designed to solve the perforated cuff deflation problem so aluminum wrapped silicon tube with unique self inflating foam sponge filled cuff which prevents deflation even after the puncture so cuff but cuff needs to be deflated at intubation and extubation using a suction you cannot uh, uh, deflate the tube in normal uh, syringe and but this is very poor with poorly resistant to all the lasers then laser tube is, is there it is made up of white rubber it has cuff within cuff the inner cuff protects the uh, inner cuff protects after the cuff uh, outer cuff injury is there or outer cuff has been perforated inner cuff is inflated by air the outer cuff is inflated with saline the shaft of the tube is covered with the silver foil so you can see this is the uh, shaft of the tube which is covered with the silver foil and it is meant for argon ndag and carbon dioxide laser so this inflation line i and o is written this is i is for inner cuff and the o is for the outer cuff coming on to the other type of tube that is laryngectomy tube these are the j shaped armored tube designed to be inserted through the tracheostomy uh, hole they have a very short tip so uh, chances of uh, dislodgement can happen and the tip beyond the cuff is also very 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 short and these may not be beveled because they directly go into the tracheostomy through the tracheostomy hole then this is a very small tube uh, most of the institutes do not have this tube but but for in information and completion sake i will tell you this is a jet ventilation tube also known as hanseker mon jet ventilation tube it is a narrow laser compatible tube the channel for subglottic high frequency jet ventilation is there outer diameter is only of 4.3 mm additional channel for measuring airway pressure or carbon dioxide levels that etco2 is also there and open cuffless open cuffless design is there and so there is a lot of contamination of environment and requires total use of tiva that is total intravenous anesthesia then this is the first tip i had shown you this is the parker flex tube parker flex tip so it's a beak shaped tip it has two murphy's eyes okay and it guides why this tube because this is non traumatic and it guides the fiber optic your fiber optic bronchoscopes right straight it doesn't uh, go left right it guides the fiber optic properly then this is the intubating lma uh, endotracheal tube you can see this uh, it is used 
while using the intubating LMA, it is straight, it is reusable, it is via reinforced, it is a silicon tube. So there's a tapered end, blunt tip, very short bevel. The cuff is high pressure, low volume cuff and it has an Murphy's eye. The sizes in which this endotracheal tube is available is 6, 6.5, 7, 7.5 and 8. So this endotracheal tube comes with the insertion um, rod also, which stabilizing rod, sorry, stabilizing rod so that you can stabilize it once inserted and take out the uh, intubating LMA over it. So coming on to this endo, endo troll or endo flex tracheal tube, you can see this is a normal, it looks like a normal PVC tube, but it has a loop over here. So this loop is attached to the tip of the endotracheal tube. When you pull the tube, the endotracheal tip goes up. So if you can see the loop is somewhere here, when you pull it, the tip is moved up. Okay, for the interior larynx, you can actually use this loop and pull up the uh, tip of the endotracheal tube. Then this is Lita tube. Lita tube is laryngotracheal installation, uh, laryngotracheal installation of local anesthesia. So this tube has uh, various spray ports above and below the cuff. There are 10 small holes above and below of the cuff and there is a separate channel for insertion of the local anesthetic agent which you can use for the smoother recovery of anesthesia from the anesthesia before extubation. Now this is the cold tube. Some institutes have this and uh, it's an emergency neonatal resuscitation tube. It is a narrow patient end because there is a subglottic narrowing is there. Uh, so this tube is uh, because the from above the lumen is big and only uh, towards the end, the lumen is narrow. The resistance offered by this tube is less, but the disadvantage is it cannot be re it cannot be inserted through the nose. Then there is this uh, EMG reinforced tracheal tube, which is uh, which may be present at your uh, institute. And even if it is not, the examiner may just ask you what is an uh, what is a special type of tube which is used in thyroid surgery. So this tube is used made to be used in thyroid surgeries. Why? Because it has these uh, electrodes above the cuff and this wire can be attached and the activity of recurrent laryngeal nerve electromyograph activity can be recorded. And if there is some injury of the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, it can be detected using this EMG reinforced tracheal tube. So these were the recent uh, from PVC to the recent uh, endotracheal tubes, the examiners sometimes are very fond of asking about the old endotracheal tubes, red rubber endotracheal tubes, and the museum of the department may have some. So you can see, this is a picture, this is the oral cuffed red rubber tube. You can see uh, same thing, A, B, C, D, E. You have to do the same thing, just the C, uh, with the cuff, the difference is high pressure, low volume cuff and the inflation, if you can see, there is no pilot balloon. The balloon is like this and either there is a stop cock which will be available to lock the um, uh, inflation line or you will have to uh, put a clamp over it so that the, uh, it, uh, the cuff is not deflated again and again. This is the uh, uncuffed endotracheal tube, nasal plane endo endotracheal tube. Then this is the one which shows the herniation, okay? And this one is the Oxford endotracheal red rubber tube. So if you have answered all of this, the examiner is very happy and they, then the examiner may ask you the history of endotracheal tube. So when did it start? It all started in 16, uh, 1667 when Mr. Robert Hooke, a Royal Society of London, in Royal Society of London, ventilated a dog with a bellows attached to it through its trachea for one hour. But then there was no, no work done upon it. Then in 1871, first inflatable cuff was being uh, invented by Frederick Trendlinburg. In 1878, William McWin, a surgeon, he placed a metal tube through the mouth into the trachea by feeling it then hence the endotracheal intubation was 
established in 1893 first use of cuffed endotracheal tube with pilot balloon by Eisenmenger was there then in 1910 uh, uh, Goodell and Waters uh, Dorrance in 1910 and Goodell and Waters in 1928 they described first rubber cuffed orotracheal tube for securing airway in general anesthesia then 1914 to 18 a concept of insufflation anesthesia uncuffed rubber tube was passed blindly through no so blind nasal intubation was established and recently in 1968 disposable polyvinyl chlorine tube with high pressure low volume cuff was introduced and in 1970 that cuff was then trans uh, changed to high volume low pressure cuff tube so this is all in all about endotracheal tube i hope i have summed it summed it up well for you and you have gained some knowledge regarding endotracheal tube and i wish you good luck thank you yeah thank you dr anjan that was a wonderful presentation yeah. and uh, a topic very important for all our postgraduates there are some thank questions you, for you from the students yes ma'am uh, one question is does mls uh, do mls tubes and laser tubes are they available for pediatric patients ma'am as i mentioned in my talk also the mls tubes are available in the sizes of 4 5 6 that's it those are the sizes available and the laser tubes they are available from sizes 5 6 7 and 8 so uh, for the uh, pediatric patients who require uh, endotracheal tube lesser than those sizes, these tubes, specialized tubes are not available yet. The next question somebody has asked, uh, which I think you had already mentioned, but still they are asking if the tube connector is male or female type. It's a male type, which is gets connected to the female type connector from the uh, breathing circuit. And the last question for you is, should we use local anesthesia before extubation in endotracheal tubes which have ports for LA? So I think they got confused that why do we need to use uh, local anesthesia before extubation? These are for the patients in which you do not want an exaggerated response during the extubation. So in those uh, uh, patients, you can this can be used. Otherwise, uh, uh, the disadvantage of using this LETA tube is also there that uh, the laryngeal reflexes may be obtunded. Even after extubation, when you want the patient fully awake, the patient may not be having all the laryngeal reflexes. So that is the disadvantage of using uh, local anesthetic just before the extubation. Uh, then there is a question which says, why can't Cole's tube be inserted through the nose? Yes, because the length is not appropriate. It is a short uh, length tube. As uh, we need a longer length uh, to fix it in the uh, uh, if you are inserted in inserting it through the nose. And then somebody is asking, please explain micro cuff tube. So micro cuff tube is basically a very thin. Uh, uh, it is. Uh, 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 the, the material in, from which it is formed is very thin material and it is also a high volume, low pressure cuff only. And the, actually, it, uh, you were saying yeah, something, ma'am? No, no, please continue. Yeah. So in, in the micro uh, cuff is actually, the cuff has a larger volume. The tube uh, inner diameter is less as compared to the cuff volume. The cuff will hold it because the tube is only four, five or six diameter. But the cuff uh, has an inflation volume as of the eight millimeters of uh, tube, endotracheal, normal endotracheal tube. So the, the strength of the cuff is good, but the material is very thin because it uh, holds the tube in the center. Okay, then uh, somebody wants to know very, uh, they want to know if there are two markings on the endotracheal tube, should both cross the vocal cords? Mm -hmm. One should cross the vocal cord. One marking you may see uh, above the vocal cords. And then Dr. Rajiv wants to know, uh, do we have separate channel in the LETA tube for above and below the cuff to install the local no, anesthesia? No, no, no. The channel is same. So channel is same that it's uh, uh, the channel is connected to all the, the eight to ten ports are there. They are 
equally distributed above and below the uh, cuff. I think that's all. And I, Dr. Anchal has answered all the questions that were there. So thank you, Anchal, for a wonderful Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma so we will move in. So now we'll move ahead with our post lunch session. So we'll continue with the post lunch session, which is a long case presentation of a 28 year old female burn contraction with flexion deformity, posted for contraction release and SSG. For this presentation, I would like to invite the external examiner. As external examiner, we have Dr. Monisha Agarwal. Ma'am is director.